as the Malone family comes up to lead us in our lighting of the Advent candle, I would tell you, ask you if you to go ahead and turn in your uh, little black books to uh, 2090, and we will sing verse 4 during the lighting of the candle. We have lit the candle of hope, peace, and joy. Today we light the candle of love. Please stand and join us as printed in your bulletin. See what we love, what God has shown us. He sent his Son into the world so that we might have life in him, both now and for eternity. See what love God has shown us, that we should be called children of God. See what love God has shown us, that he has poured his love in our hearts. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we thank you for Jesus who came as your word, your love made flesh. And on this day, may we open ourselves to not only feel love by you, but also spread your love to everyone we meet. Not only at Christmas, but always. Amen. And let us remain standing and sing together, Angels from the Realms of Glory.
and you may want to turn in your hymnals to number 87. That's the uh, song that we will send the kids off with. And would the kids like to come forward? Okay, I know you're going to be really enthusiastic today. Good morning. Good morning. I knew it. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Almost. Right. <laughs> are you all ready for this week? Yes. Yeah, yeah. What are some of you doing? Is anyone going off Cape on for Christmas? Or are you going to be around? You going off Cape? Where are you going? Worcester? Good. Where are you going? Where are you going, Amy? Jeron's house? She lives off Cape? Good, good. What's a, what are some of your favorite parts of Christmas? Yeah. Um, the, joy. the joy? Very good. Very good. Yeah, Tim? The presents. The presents? I wondered how long it would be. Good. <laughs> well, we love spending time with you, too, Brennan. And that, I didn't tell him what to say, either. <laughs> what else? Anyone else? What else do you like about Christmas? How about food? Do you get like fun food or special foods or just hot dogs for Christmas? <laughs> okay. Well, oh, that's okay. Once in a while, it's good. And being with family and friends. But I bet most of you, I bet probably Tim was one of the most honest when he said he likes the presents. And we all, we all like getting presents and giving presents, but why, why do we even give and receive presents? At Christmas time. Yeah. Right? A way of giving is a way of being nice to people? That's right. Why else? Why else? Well, let me ask a question. Whose birthday is it? Jesus. Jesus. Right. It's Jesus' birthday. And when Jesus was born, there were wise men that came and brought Jesus' gifts. And so we give gifts because we're honoring what happened to Jesus. You know, it's not just about getting things for us, but it's remembering that we're doing it because someone gave gifts to Jesus. And when you think about it, that it's really Jesus' birthday, shouldn't he be the one to receive the best gift, the most gifts, any gift? And what do you think would Jesus would want for Christmas? If you were going to give something to Jesus for Christmas, what do you think Jesus might want? Happiness, right, right. And what's a way of giving happiness? You know, Jesus said one time, he said, love God and love one another. And that was so important to Jesus that he told his disciples that the night before he died. He said, this I want you to do. I want you to love one another. That is the gift that Jesus wants us for us to, to share with one another, to care for one another, to laugh when each other laughs, to cry when each other cries, to love one another for those we know and those we don't. And a lot of you brought in gifts today to give in honor of Jesus getting presents. And you've given for babies in honor of Jesus being born as a baby. And I'm going to ask all of you, even if you brought, if you brought your um, diapers and wipes, and even if you didn't, I want you to go in, up to the manger, and as you lay your gift on the manger, or as you stand there, I want you to think of one thing you can do this week that's going to show love to someone. You know, maybe it's just a phone call to say Merry Christmas. Maybe it's writing a thank you note to someone who did something for you. Maybe it's holding the door open for someone. Maybe it's doing something at home without your mom having to ask you to do it. But whatever it is, I want you to think of one thing that you're going to do that shows you love one another and tell Jesus when you go back to the manger. So can you take your things back to the manger and everybody go back and tell Jesus what you're going to give to him. Even if you didn't, I want you to go up to the manger and just think of one thing you're going to give and tell Jesus what it is. And then you can come back and sit down.
Very good. Can we pray? Dear Jesus, truly it really is happy birthday to you. And it really is you that we should think about giving to. And we know that in giving to you means giving to others and loving others. And so this Christmas, may we remember, Lord, that it is what is within us that is giving ourselves. It is giving who we are that loves and accepts and forgives and embraces one another just as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He was born so far away So the story's told We remember Christmas Day When winter days grow cold With the time that passes by we put away the trim Then we sit and wonder why We can remember him The Christmas star shines once a year And then it fades away Keep the spirit in your heart It's Christmas every day It's not the bells and it's not the snow It's not the gifts we get But he was born so long ago It's easy to forget Peace on earth, goodwill to men But men can't go alone We get lost along the way but he can bring us home Remember him throughout the year Without the star above He left us all a Christmas gift He left the gift of love the Christmas star shines once a year And then it fades away Keep 
the Spirit in your heart. And it's Christmas every day. As we come to our time of prayer together, I would turn your attention to those on Northside's prayer of concern list, certainly for those who are hurting in whatever ways this Christmas, and I think of the family of uh, Claire Davis, the 17-year-old high school girl who was shot in Colorado who has died, um, so we certainly keep her family and all who are uh, uh, grieving or hurting anyway this, this season. We also pray for our lock-in um, this coming fr uh, Thursday night as uh, several high school and uh, junior high kids will be in these doors and fellowshipping and worshiping with one another, and so we keep the lock-in in our prayers. There will be a time for you to lift the names of others, um, but now let us just be in that quiet, sacred time of prayer. <coughs> O loving and eternal God, we are so grateful for this time of quiet, this time to be in your presence. Not that we are ever away from your presence, but too often we forget or ignore the fact that you are ever present, that you know all that we do and think and say, even those things we wish you didn't know. But you do know all, Lord, and the miracle is that you still love us, and you forgive us, and you are willing to help us learn and try again. And we know that because you actually came to live among us. You humbled yourself and came out of heaven to become one of us, to show us God in person, to show us how to live and how to love. You came to share with us in our joys and celebrations, as well as in our sorrows and in our pains. And we are so thankful. And as we get closer to the day when we celebrate the birth of Christ, we really do want to think on what it means that you would so love the world, so love each one of us, that you would come as Emmanuel, God with us, each and every day of our lives, in all our situations. And so speak to us, Lord. Speak a word of peace to our fears, a word of comfort to our suffering, a word of faith to our doubting hearts. Be a light that shines in our dark places, our dark moments. May Christ be born anew in us this day, not only for our sake, but that we might be a light to others. And on this Sunday of love, we pray that our words and actions will come from a genuine love for you and for others. And help us to be so sure of your love for us that we freely and unconditionally offer that same love to all that we meet. And Lord, this day we are aware that for some this Christmas will be difficult. There are those who are grieving, grieving the loss of a loved one or the loss of health or the loss of a relationship. There are those who feel there is little or no hope for their situation. There are those who are looking for love and meaning in the wrong places and finding only emptiness. There are those who feel financially strapped and wonder what the future will hold. And so we pray, speak to all who are hurting. Give them your guidance, your comfort, your presence, that they might know a loving God cares for them. Lord, there are also specific people and situations we wish to bring to you. And so hear us now as people in this congregation lift aloud those names for which, whom we ask your blessing. And, O oh Lord, as we have come to you aloud, we come to you now in silence with our 
own personal prayers. O oh God, we pray that as we continue in our worship and when we leave here today, we would be blessed with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of the Christ child, in whose name we pray and whose prayer we now stand and sing. <laughs> Receive these gifts to do our do your work here in Cape Cod and throughout the world. Make us good stewards of these funds to spread the good word of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Maybe see them. Our first scripture reading today comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And 
This is the beginning of its early Christianity. Churches are just forming and people are learning what it is that who Christ was and what he taught and why he came and also what that means for their lives and how we are now to, to live, um, not selfishly but sacrificially, how we are to love. And so Paul has some of these instructions for those in the early church and for us today. <coughs> Love from the center of who you are. Don't just uh, pretend to love others. Love them genuinely. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply, good to friends who love deeply. Outdo one another in showing honor. Play second fiddle. Don't burn out. Work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Be cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Cry with them when they're down. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't claim to be wiser than you are. Never pay back a wrong with more wrong. Discover beauty in everyone. Do all that you can to get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you, <clears throat> that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. And our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel <coughs> of John. And oftentimes we wonder what people's last words would be to us. Well, Jesus has last words for his disciples and for us. It is the night before he is to die. And he tells his disciples what he asks of them. And so let us stand for the reading of the Gospel. <coughs> This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. And as your friend, I command you that you love one another. The word of God. Thanks be to God. I want to start out today by sharing with you a song. It's a new song that talks about an old and familiar story, uh, the Christmas story. It's sung from Jesus' perspective about what happened on that night and why he came to be our friend. And so let's listen. <coughs> Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do
I was born in Bethlehem Two thousand years have passed since then And I've done what I can To be there when a man can't find a friend On the streets of Bethlehem As the story always said We were trying to find a bed It was cold, I was late And we stood outside the locked gate of the inn Until the kindness of strangers let us in To a stable round the back Little more than a shack Where my sweet mother, meek and mild And herself only a child Gave her best Then took her rest Do, 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 do The door then came a knock Shepherds who had quit their flock With their eyes round with fear Daddy jumped up and cried Get out of here But mother stilled him And bid them draw near I was there but couldn't see The unfolding mystery Kings with their presents of gold Myrrh and frankincense Who set them before the land Neath the star of Bethlehem I was born in Bethlehem It's been two thousand years since then But I've done what I can To be there when a man can find a friend I was born in Bethlehem centuries, we have come to look at Jesus in many ways and call him by many names, Lord, Teacher, Healer, Prince of Peace, Light of the World, Bread of Life, Savior, to name a few, all names that reflect his uniqueness, his position and give him the honor that he is due. And at Christmas, we rejoice in and revere the fact that he came to us as a baby. For really, what better way for God to make his presence known than as a newborn? Because we can all identify with that, can't we? When we look at any newborn baby, don't we feel peace and serenity? Don't we see hope and joy and love in that child? Yes, peace and hope and joy and love, all those beautiful feelings we Christians cherish and celebrate during the season of Advent as we anticipate the coming of the Christ child. 
And I really believe that God continues to remind us of those wonderful feelings with every single child that comes into this world, even to this day. It's God's way of telling us that he hasn't given up on us. Not yet. Not by a long shot. And as wonderful as babies may be, yet another wonderful way of looking at and describing Jesus is what we heard in the song. But I've done what I can to be there when a man can't find a friend. Jesus describing himself as a friend, a good friend, most especially at those times in our lives when we are in need when we are hurting. It's like the old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, says, Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Are we weak and heavy laden, encumbered with a load of care? We should never be discouraged, never, for we have a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share. Yes, what a friend we have in Jesus. And Jesus himself speaks of the depth of his friendship. On that night before he went to the cross to sacrifice his life for all of humankind, he made this statement, greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. And then he goes on to say, you are my friends. When Jesus is calling you and me here, you and me, his friends. I mean, how great is that? But then as our friend, he goes on to tell us, this is my command that you love one another. Love one another as I have loved you completely and unconditionally. And how many of us here always and ever follow that command? I thought so. You know, I think we all struggle with that thou shall love one another command? I mean, first of all, it's way too vague in general, don't you think? It's like Nancy Pelosi said of Obamacare. We first have to make it a law in order to find out what's in it and if we like it. Well, Jesus did make it a law, and we don't like it. Because secondly, and more importantly, most of us struggle with commands that tell us how we're supposed to live our lives. I mean, take the Ten Commandments, for example. Thou shall not covet. Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not lust. Thou shall not have any fun. (laughs) Those thou shall nots, and even those thou shalls, seem to rub us prideful humans the wrong way. So in today's scripture, St. Paul attempts to put those thou shalt love one another command into a clearer and more understandable form. Now let's listen again. Love from the center of who you are. Don't pretend to love others. Love them genuinely. Be good friends. Love deeply. Outdo one another in showing honor. That means playing second fiddle. Don't quit on friends when times get hard. Be inventive in hospitality, especially to those needy and different from us. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Live in harmony with each other. Make friends with nobodies. Don't try to be a great somebody. Don't pay back a wrong with a wrong. 
Discover beauty in everybody. Get along with everyone. Don't insist on getting even. If you see your enemy hungry, go buy him lunch. Or if she's thirsty, buy her a drink. I don't know about the rest of you, but if it's all the same to you, Paul, can I have that vague and very general command of Jesus back? But seriously, though, if, if this is a list of how we are to be good Christians, good disciples, good friends of Jesus Christ, then most of us are, how shall we say it, not? I mean, consider. I'm talking to mom and dad on the phone, but all the while checking my emails and surfing the net. Love genuinely. Consider, I'm at a church conference and the person across the aisle answers all my suggestions with, yes, but, no cursing under your breath, Rebecca. (laughs) Consider the person who talks about me, gossiping, making insinuations. Don't get even, bless your enemies. Now, does that blessing have to be in public or can it be in private? Can I just get away with a prayer like, well, God bless you for who and what you obviously are. (laughs) Doesn't cut it, does it? (laughs) You know, Paul said that we are to live in harmony with one another, which is proof he never married or had children or had a normal job. (laughs) But you see, loving one another means loving in all of the daily ups and downs, in all of the difficulties and differences, in all the big and small ways that we interact with one another. And to obey Christ's command, we need to take the first step to change things. Then consider the meeting where that one person is so abrasive and negative. Love deeply anyway. Play second fiddle. Then consider. You're in a rush and you see an old person carrying some poorly wrapped packages into the post office and you know you've got to beat them to the door with that one package or you'll be there all day. Outdo one another in showing honor. Then consider, you know, for years the high school students were dropped off here outside in the freezing weather and rain. How nice of Northside to provide them a bus stop, don't you think? But finally, it was Evie who was inventive in her hospitality and invited them inside with a comfortable place to sit and be warm and enjoy some snacks. Consider all the nobodies that come into the thrift shop. Discover the beauty in everyone. And show them through your words and actions what Christian friendship and love is all about. And then consider the homeless we struggle with, freeloading on the street. Buy that person lunch. You see, the point I obviously want to make is that we all fall short of meeting that command of Christ to love one another. You know, in many ways it's so hard to do, but it should be so easy considering just how much God loves us unconditionally, as imperfect as we are. And I'm reminded of that painting by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, his vision of the bond of love as it was first established, so easily, so naturally depicted. Let's look at it a moment. There's God reaching down from the heavens, reaching out to touch 
the finger of Adam. Even though Adam in his humanity appears somewhat casual about it all. And reflect on that image for a moment of God earnestly, lovingly reaching out to us. Now think of Christmas, this season when God actually came to us in human form to show us firsthand how to love completely and unconditionally. He proved categorically that we don't have to be a big somebody to affect the world. He proved that we don't have to get even or degrade somebody or appear wiser, or fear strangers, or insist on getting our way to earn respect and admiration. He proved that mercy and compassion are worth more in God's eyes than wealth and power. He proved that it is better to give than to receive. He proved that it is stronger to forgive than to hate. He proved all that and more. And the only reason we have the slightest idea of what genuine love looks like is because we have been first loved that way by God. And although we do fall short of the goal that God has set for us, like I said earlier, God hasn't given up on us, not yet and not by a long shot. Because there are three things that work in our favor. First, the psalmist tells us the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are as high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on us. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are but just dust. The second thing is that we Christians, as imperfect as we are, may fail. But we are part of a community where together we help each other day after day, again after again and again, practice the kind of living, the kind of love that makes us different from the rest of the world. Don't you feel encouragement and support as we worship together, fellowship together, work together? I know I do. And the third thing, and the most important thing, is that we're not alone. We have a friend in Jesus, a friend in the business of love. Amen. And so your invitation to Christian discipleship this week is sometime during the week, go and open your Bibles and go back to that phrase in Romans, that that scripture, and reflect and ask yourself, where do I love one another well? And where do I need to love one another a little better? In the name of that one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, sustainer, may you go in peace. Amen. (laughs) 